So, um, yes. Huh? Oh, the keyboard, yeah. Uh, you want to do it on Danny or yeah? Okay, so let me just recap a little bit of what we were talking about last lecture. So So um, uh, we talked about, we introduced several elementary gates, uh, Z, X, H, and so forth, and the key point is that uh, for universality, that means so that you can construct an arbitrary quantum algorithm, you need one and two qubit gates, and so the two qubit gate, we, we're going to use C0. One qubit gate, here are three examples, but uh, actually, you need a few more, um, so uh, that depends on the algorithm. And I introduced this sort of general structure, the kind of um, standard form of the uh, quantum circuit. And so, um, so here we've got the uh, measurement uh, outcomes in the zero one basis, and then the um, initial state always in the zero, zero state. And the inside of that could be some combination of these C0 gates and the single qubit gates. Um, here's some rules. Basically, you go left to right and you can't uh, have any of these sort of branching type of uh, sequences. And uh, I think we discussed how, why the initial state couldn't be just this um, uh, arbitrary state, uh, uh, well, it doesn't have to be, and basically because we can just have a preparation circuit to make that, and then we can just call that whole thing the algorithm. So, uh, without loss of generality, we can start with zero. And oh, that's just a caution of the notation. And similarly, uh, making a measurement in the zero one basis is not a restriction because we can have some rotation just before the measurement and that will actually uh, is equivalent to measuring in a different basis and um, I gave you sort of the sort of general proof of why uh, this combination of the, the basis and the measurement is equivalent to a general measurement um, did you want me to do a simple example because this is a, looks a little bit technical? Um, I'll just do something for a, a qubit, say. Yeah. Okay, all right. Okay, so let's do an example of this for this measurement. Uh, well, okay. Uh, in a general basis. So the idea is that we have, so say, say uh, what we were trying to do was to measure the state of a qubit like this, right? And say we were going to do the measurement in the plus minus basis. So in this case, the measurement operator would be like n plus and n minus. And so, for example, if we did a measurement on this state and we got the plus outcome, then what that would correspond to is that we get a plus here, and then the plus acts on the zero alpha beta. And um, uh, before, we worked out that things like plus zero and minus overlap to zero with or one over root two. So this was alpha over beta to root two. So this is uh, what we did before. Okay, I'm just doing this, repeating that just so that we have something to compare our result to. 
So um, uh, another way to do that is to write this state in the plus minus basis, and then I won't show the work to have done it before. Um, and so we can write it like this. And again, we see that the uh, we do the plus minus measurement, then we'll we'll get this coefficient. Okay. So now let's. Let's say that um, uh, so this is so this is equivalent to um, so the equivalent circuit of just measuring in the plus minus basis. So if I have a qubit, here's my measurement device, and it's uh, in the the basis is the plus minus basis. So basically what I'm saying is that this is going to be equivalent to this circuit, which is uh, Hadamard gate. And then in this case, the basis is uh, 0, 1. Okay. And so let me show that you get the same result. So, um, uh, so we've got our state that's coming in. And the Hadamard uh, gate is so the matrix which um, I wrote before is is this. So that means if I start with the state zero, then I'm going to get this first column. So actually, this is. This is uh, what the Hadamard gate does. It basically converts zero into, into plus. Uh, and similarly, H acting on one gives zero state minus one state. And that's actually minus. So basically, another way to think of this Hadamard gate is that it's a, some kind of conversion between this zero state and just turns it into a plus state. And the one state turns it into a minus state. So, um, so then let's evaluate this circuit here. So what what will happen is that so our initial state is the the thing up there. That's that's our initial state. And then um, if I apply the oh, uh, yeah, that's fine. if I apply the Hadamard gate on this state side, then I'll get zero. This is. I'll put a little hat on it just to emphasize that this is the operator. Right? Okay. And then I've written down what these rules are. So. Okay. So it turns into this state. And now, actually, because we're going to measure in this zero one basis. So let me actually uh, rewrite this state in terms of the 0, 1 basis. And so the, yeah, so the, yeah, so the plus state is actually 0 plus 1. And the minus state is actually 0 minus 1. And then I just factorize. And then now when I measure in the zero one basis, I'm going to get with, with probability this thing, zero, uh, that, so the zero probability will be that, and then the one probability will be you know, the same thing with minus squared, sorry, squared. So, uh, so we, pay, we get the same result. So, uh, over here, what, what was happening was that we're measuring the plus, plus minus basis, and then we get this coefficient of alpha plus beta over 2, you know, over here. Over here, we're measuring the 0, 1 basis, and then we get the same result. 
Um, now you might you might be looking at this and go, oh yeah, but like this one is like zero one, and this one is plus minus, right? So it looks looks like it's not the same. Um, uh, basically, this is uh, because we're kind of um, uh, you know, by by doing this, what we're basically doing is to kind of redefine the basis. So um, over here, because this had a mod, what it does is it kind of converts zero to plus and one to, to minus. That's why we have this sort of um, discrepancy. So we, uh, you know, the, the physical measurement outcomes are the same. Um, and so in this case, you know, what used to be the plus outcomes, you now get as a zero outcome. And what used to be the minus outcomes, you now get as one, right? So it's not that you get the same uh, physical measurement. It's just that basically, according to this Hanuman gate, it's uh, kind of being transferred so that this plus corresponds to zero and minus corresponds to one. Um, but uh, all the probabilities are the same, and uh, so the you know in terms of your readout. You get exactly the same result. Okay. Makes sense. Any questions? Yeah. So all the things will be the same. They'll all correspond to the zero one. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So but even though physically so you're measuring yeah different states, like the, there's an exact correspondence between as if you measure in the zero in the plus minus space. Okay, so, all right, so that's the story with measurements and, you know, and, and that goes for a more complicated thing with a more complicated sort of, uh, you know, basis uh, rotation. Okay, so, okay, so let's now um, look at our first quantum circuit. So. I decided, I don't, you know, what, what is the simplest quantum circuit? There's various uh, choices that you can make, but I thought maybe this is actually um, a nice and simple, easy one. Some textbook might start with other ones, but um, this will also raise some interesting questions later. So, um, a, a simple quantum circuit is the uh, swap circuit, and the aim of this circuit is, as the name sort of suggests, uh, is to swap the inputs of the qubits here. So you start with psi here and phi here, and what you should have at the end is phi and psi. So uh, it consists of three C0 gates in this sort of anti-parallel kind of orientation. And Whenever you uh, are given a quantum circuit, um, basically the way that I do it, which um, I think is the way that makes the most sense, is to just ba basically break down the circuit basically step by step. Right? So this is just nothing but some kind of sequence of gates that you're applying to the system. So basically just apply the gates you know, step by step. Here's the first one, here's the second one, here's the third one. Just apply it, apply it in sequence. So that's, that's what we'll do. So what I like to do is to draw a little sort of uh, red line here or you know, any line. Uh, it basically just shows like the time sequence. It's like your scroll bar in, in your YouTube video. You know, this is where you are at at the moment. So uh, the initial state is just uh, this one, so T0. So it's just the product of these two. So let me call these things uh, have some coefficients, alpha, beta, gamma, lambda. Okay. So there's, there's some coefficients. Um, and I have chosen sort of a, sort of a somewhat specific state of uh, this initial state as a kind of a product state. And because basically that's um, where this kind of swap gate sort of has its um, most simple to understand kind of uh, operation. 
Okay, so we can equally write this as some, um, just expand that out in the usual way. Okay, so that's just the initial state. Next we apply our C first C0 gate, this one. So it's the control on the first qubit and the, uh, the not part of it is acting on the second qubit. And so um, uh, we, we did something like this last lecture, uh, but I think the simplest way to do it is just according to sort of the definition of the C0. So the C0 means control not, so the control is the first qubit and it will flip the second qubit depending on if the um, first one is one or not. So in these four terms here, zero, 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 one, and so forth, um, what we're looking at is like the first qubit. Uh, if the first qubit is zero, we don't have to do anything. Uh, but if the first qubit is one, then we are gonna flip the second qubit. So this term and this term, we should flip the second qubit. Um, so that's what I've done over here. So this, this beta gamma one is now one one, and the beta lambda one is now one zero. Okay, and now we just keep on doing that um, a few more times. Um, this time the control is on the second qubit, right? So we have to kind of reverse the uh, logical sort of direction. So uh, this one, is the second qubit is zero, so we don't have to do anything. This one, we're gonna have to flip that one. Uh, this one also we're going to have to flip that one. This one we're just not going to do anything. So these middle two, the first qubit is going to be flipped. Okay. So here this one's one one, and this guy turns into zero one. The other other two are the same. Okay. And then and then we do the last uh, one again, just taking the state from the previous page. And so again, a control qubit on the first, and then flip the second. Uh, if it's zero, if it's one, sorry, so this one is going to be flipped, and this one's going to be flipped. So uh, that's going to be one zero, this one's going to be one one. Okay, and then now we can uh, attempt to factorize this equation. So we've got like two alphas here, and we can see that the first uh, qubit is uh, different, but the second qubit is both zero. So we can factorize out the second state here. Um, and of course, be careful not to mess with the orderings of these qubits. Uh, so if it's uh, you know, one, zero, don't factorize it. So it's zero is out. This zero state is out here because that's obviously going to change the state, right? So this ordering matters. So this uh, zero uh, should be kind of behind in the bracket. Uh, this one we can factorize out also the one from the second uh, qubit. Right? So that's why the one is out here and it's behind. The beta is just a constant, so you can put that anyway. So you can put that at the front. Okay, and then now we can look at the inside of the brackets and then that's exactly the same. So then we can factorize this uh, second qubit into this form. So uh, compared to what we had at the beginning, well, this one that's alpha beta is now, is what we initially called psi, and the one that we called gamma lambda is what we called phi. Um, and because the first uh, qubit is the one on top here, that means that the first, the, the, this, this qubit in this line is actually uh, phi, and the qubit that's on the bottom here is actually psi. So that's exactly the opposite of what we had at the beginning. So psi uh, phi becomes phi psi. Okay, so it's the swap gate. All right, great. Um, so, well, um, that's a simple little circuit. Um, that uh, it's, a, it's definitely a quantum circuit because you know these are um, superposition states. So. This a alpha and beta gamma lambda I could have chosen to be anything, right? So they could be um, these states could have been just regular zero one, but it could have equally been some other superposition. 
And I didn't have to tell this circuit what these parameters were. This circuit will always work for any alpha, beta, uh, gamma, lambda. So long that it's in this kind of product state that I started. Um, yep. I think you mean times tensor Right, yes. Uh, but yes, I, I, I sort of realized that while I'm saying it. know about property states. Yes. Um, so what I mean by product state is that actually it's a, it's not an entangled state. Remember we were talking also about entangled states like mm -hmm. zero, zero, one, one. Uh, actually, if you put in an entangled state, um, I think depending on the state, like sort of like nothing will happen or, or, the, or it might change into a different entangled state. So uh, it's less clear what the meaning of this swap uh, circuit is when it's an entangled state. So that's why I didn't show it. But um, of course, uh, you can put it in an entangled state, nothing wrong with that. Um, it's just that, you know, okay, you wouldn't really be convinced that it's a swap operation because it would maybe do nothing or something. Um, but in this case where it's just uh, two individual qubits, uh, that's what I mean by a, a product state, the independent qubits, then, then yeah, it swaps. Okay, um, so, okay, swap, fair enough. Um, you know, you, had a, you have a quantum computer and then, you know, you've got two qubits and so on, but they're not entangled, you can, you can swap them. Okay, great. Um, now, maybe what is even better than swap is, uh, is a copy circuit, right? Because, um, you know, God knows how many times you use control C, control V every day, right? So, um, so uh, how about a, a copy circuit? So, so why don't we try and make such a copy circuit? Because um, uh, you know that sounds maybe even more useful than a swap swap uh, circuit, right? Okay. So uh, how is this done classically? Well, um, in terms of logical gates, it would look something like this. And um, so this is like a OR gate, where one of the um, inputs is um, the the thing that you're trying to copy. And then the other bit, you just initialize that to zero always. And uh, I'm going to sort of, because, you know, the OR gate only has one output, you know, we need at least two outputs, of course. So, so this, uh, I'm going to draw a line here, just, just sort of um, transferring that also to the end. And so OR means, you know, if it's uh, zero, uh, zero, then the output is zero, but if it's one zero, then the output is one. Right? So you can easily see that if uh, you have x and zero here, then this output will be x and x. Right? So that, that, that looks like a, well, no, that is a copy circuit uh, in terms of classical um, logic. Right? So certainly, classically, uh, that, that could be one way to write it. Okay, so so if that's the uh, copy circuit, so circuit, sorry, um, uh, classically, then you know maybe we can just sort of start with that, and then hopefully it works out even in a quantum case. Okay. So um, so actually this uh, or I think I said before that uh, C not gate is something like XOR, but um, uh, in this situation where the input is only zero. Uh, actually, XOR or regular OR is uh, equally fine because um, uh, if one is zero, then uh, XOR and OR are the same. Okay, so <coughs> so uh, because so OR or XOR is, is basically the same kind of gate. So let's let's try our C not gate, uh, which uh, does have this type of logic, right? So if we put in zero. Here, so let's let's first start off with the classical case, but you know, kind of edging towards quantum in a minute. Um, but you know, just check it, check that this still works for just the regular kind of classical input. So when psi is either zero or one, so controlled not means that um, depending on this one, you have flipped this one, right? 
So that means if this top qubit is zero, then we're not going to do anything. Okay, so zero, zero. That was like, it's kind of copied it. Uh, and then if this is one, then we need to flip it, right? So we're going to flip that to one. So, okay, our code is one, one. Okay, so, so far so good. Um, this looks something just like the uh, OR circuit that we did before. So, um, okay, so, so far so good. So let's try it for like a more like fully quantum state. So let's now put in a more general superposition here. So alpha, beta, I'm going to put that there. And then apply the C not gate. Okay, and okay, if it's zero, then we do nothing. If it's one, we flip it. So in other words, we're going to get this state. Okay. So, uh, well, in some sense, you know, it looks like some kind of copy. But actually, it's not exactly like the, the, the copy that we sort of had in mind. Um, you know, something a little bit more like that swap gate. In the swap gate, basically, we had two independent circuits and then we swapped it, right? So in this case, uh, kind of what we, would, what we might expect is, um, uh, you know, if we had, uh, you know, this input state, uh, you know, if we got this state, we would say, yeah, okay, that's, that's definitely a copy, right? It's copying that quantum state uh, onto the second one. But uh, that state here is actually, we can expand it out to be that, it's clearly not the same as that thing, right? Okay, so basically, somehow, you know, this didn't really work. Um, so we were not able uh, well, we can just use a, sort of a guess here um, to do that copy. So as it turns out, it's actually impossible to make a copy uh, circuit. Um, and uh, the proof goes something like this. So uh, we're going to do a proof by contradiction. Okay. So here's here's our state that we're trying to copy. Suppose you know there's some circuit like this, so there's some hypothetical uh, U copy, some unitary operation, and it does this, this thing here, where phi becomes, and then you input zero, and then phi becomes like two phi here. And we can have like a global phase because we know the global phase never does anything. Okay, and then uh, what we do is we say, okay, well, this copy circuit has to work for all different phi, okay? so. Let's, let's take two examples of phi, so phi and phi dash. Um, and then let's take like the inner product, well let's start with this inner product between those two. Okay, so this is a little bit of sort of mathematical manipulation here. So it might not be clear why you are taking inner product, but let, let's just do that. Okay. So inner product are two general qubit states. Okay, and then I can introduce a factor of one here, and then zero and zero are also uh, uh, the overlap in a product of them as one, so I can just, I'm introducing that factor. Um, I can take one of these zeros from here and, and put it next to this guy, make a tensor product, similarly with the other side. Now I can uh, kind of use the well, okay, no, sorry. Uh, I can apply this hypothetical unitary operation, this copy unitary, and because this thing, u dagger u is one, uh, I can also introduce that, so I'm introducing another factor of one here, and then I can use this relation to say, well, okay, so if that's equals to that, then that should be that. And then now what's happened is that I started with phi in a product of phi prime, and I've got that's equal to phi overlap of phi prime squared. Okay. And there's some phase factor here, but even if we don't worry about the phase factor, uh, essentially, okay, well, if we square this equation to get rid of this phase, then uh, I'll have something like this quantity modulus squared is equal to this quantity modulus uh, to the power of 4. 
And uh, that can be true. It's just that uh, you can't just have any, any states. You can't just have any old phi and phi prime. You need basically uh, these things, these two states, to be... So, well, this equation is only true if this is either 0 or 1. And so that basically means that uh, we kind of need to choose our states like phi. So if phi was uh, some state like this, then phi prime could only either be phi or the state uh, orthogonal to phi, which means, um, I think we did this a little while ago, state orthogonal to phi is, is this one. So kind of only, uh, yeah, it, it would only work, like this proof would only work if we restricted phi to uh, just like two, two, two values. And, and that's not really a very good copy circuit because if it only works for a very restricted set of states, then it kind of, you know, it's not really a very general kind of thing. So, um, so that's the proof of, this is a famous result that's called the uh, no cloning theorem. And the no cloning theorem um, actually was um, kind of uh, realized quite late actually. Um, so, you know, quantum mechanics has been around since early 20th century. But nobody really was thinking in terms of information or anything like this until relatively kind of, you know, recently. And when I say recently, just, you know, last several decades. So, okay, so it's already 2021, so, um, you know, perhaps this is to you guys quite old, but uh, for me, it's, it's, it's actually sort of, you know, more recent. Right? So, um, usually all these foundational results, you expect them to be discovered, you know, when quantum mechanics was discovered, so, you know, like a hundred years ago. So this is sort of 1970s, and probably nobody really uh, read this paper, and so it was rediscovered by another bunch of guys in 1982. Um, and so, uh, um, well, yeah, so this kind of illustrates a, a few things that, um, well, you know, if we can't actually even copy information, then, um, I mean, firstly, it, you know, it kind of makes quantum algorithms, making quantum algorithms pretty hard because, you know, you sort of take it for granted that, you know, you've got some variable, just copy the variable, you know, you, you do this kind of thing all the time. But if you can't even copy any sort of information, then it means, you know, making algorithms, you, there's really some kind of sort of special art to it that, uh, that uh, you really have to work within these sort of kind of bounds. Um, um, but I mean, one, one thing that I should say is that, well, uh, I mean, that's what I just said is true, but uh, it also, uh, you know, don't forget that this thing actually is actually consistent with regular quantum physics, uh, sorry, regular uh, classical physics, right? So, so, of course, you can copy classical data. It's just that you can't do a general copy operation of quantum kind of data. So, um, so this is why sort of, uh, you know, the question of, you know, how this extra quantum degrees of freedom can be used is still sort of an ongoing question. It's not, not so easy just to sort of come up with quantum algorithms because you've got certain restrictions you have to sort of deal with. And ultimately it comes from the fact that, you know, we have some unitary operation that showing this equation is unitary, you have to sort of, can't just sort of do any, um, okay, I think, yeah, that's the end of this, this set. Are there any questions? Um, Professor, can you go back to the last one? This one? The, uh, yeah. The, the friends? Mm. Brightest sign, so it turns out to be a 
many times the space gray triangle? Uh, yeah, so it's just from this assumption or you know this uh, general form here. So we uh, hypothesize that there's this copy circuit, right? Mm -hmm. And because um, global phase doesn't matter, we just put this in just you know just to be safe in a way. Um, and so if we apply this equation to this part, right? then we will get uh, some, uh, well, we get that phase there. Cool. Um, but you know, this state here is uh, different to this state here. So, okay, so maybe, maybe what I didn't quite mention is that okay, perhaps this phase is also dependent on phi. Right? So maybe this uh, phase you get over here is actually different to the phase that you get over the left and the right side. Yeah. yeah. Okay, and the, the left, the right part and the left part are conjugate with each other. Yes, that's right. Yeah. yeah. So th this this stuff here is the conjugate of all that stuff. Well, I mean, sorry, uh, up to the different phi, but but basically this stuff here is conjugate of But um, I mean, we just put this in here for safety, basically, because we didn't know what was going to happen. Um, but in the end, it doesn't really matter anyway, because we can just take the modulus. Uh, I might have said modulus. You just take the modulus of this one. So the, the um, yeah, uh, of that equation, and then then you the phase goes away anyway. And then um, so oh no, sorry, you do take the modulus. This is the left side, and modulus squared of that is that. Uh, modulus squared of that side is that side, and then this phase disappears. Okay. All right. Okay. Well, let's keep on going. So, so basically for the rest of the course, uh, I'm just going to cover a few different types of quantum algorithms. And, well, we might come back to that wave function thing. But, um, uh, but uh, Balka will be talking about different quantum algorithms. So the first one that we're going to do is uh, Deutsch's algorithm. Um, and this one is sort of, uh, it's quite famous because I think it's the first quantum algorithm that shows that uh, quantum computers are, are faster than um, uh, classical algorithms. So, um, yeah, so as I, as I say here, basically at, at this point, you know, okay, I haven't really, we haven't really got a very good reason why we we should be looking at quantum algorithms at all because, uh, you know, in fact, uh, as I was saying, it's kind of restrictive because you can't even do certain types of operations. So, um, so it seems actually quite difficult to make quantum algorithms. So why would you want to make quantum algorithms? Well, um, basically in 1985, David Deutsch invented the first quantum algorithm that showed that um, it, uh, quantum computers might be sort of more powerful than, than classical computers. And um, it's actually a kind of a completely useless problem. Um, so it doesn't really help, but the um, help in terms of any kind of practical application. But it's, uh, it shows you that 
you know, it's sort of a hint that there might be something to quantum computers. So, so still, it's sort of um, one of the more famous algorithms. Okay, so so here is the the kind of the the problem that this algorithm solves. Okay, and uh, as I said, it's it's not a very useful problem. It's not it's not a problem that anybody would want to sort of solve in practice, but yeah, it's kind of a purposely made problem for this for this kind of algorithm, right? Okay, so so let's uh, look at uh, this function f. Okay, it's a binary function, so it's got uh, inputs that are binary. In other words, x is binary, and then the output is also binary. Okay, so in such a situation. Uh, there's actually only four possible functions, right? So, um, in the binary world, things are very simple. So, uh, the four functions are right here. So, basically, there's this function here that's, that's uh, constant on zero, constant on one, or there's the one that is going up, or the one that's going down. Okay, that, that, that's all the functions that exist in this kind of binary uh, single bit world. Okay, so um, let's call uh, these ones which are flat, let's call them these constant functions because, well, they're obviously constant. And let's call these ones which are kind of slow, let's call them balanced. And I think they're called balanced because uh, half of them are like one, half of the outputs are one, and half the outputs are zero, for both cases. Okay. It's just the name. Okay, so, um, now let's suppose we've got some black box where it's going to be one of these functions, but we don't know which one. So somebody makes this, uh, makes this box and you can put in some numbers to test out what the output is going to be. The output is um, f of x, of course. Um, but you don't know which of these functions it's going to be because you know your friend made it and he's keeping it a secret from, from you. Okay, and then basically the problem or the task is to figure out, so do we have a constant function? Do we have one of these blue ones? Or do we have a balanced function? Do we have one of the red ones? Okay. And as you can see, you know, there are probably no applications of this particular problem because you know, it's kind of a little bit arbitrary of why we call it uh, you know, constant or balanced, but, but okay, but that's, that's the problem that we're going to try and solve. And uh, uh, we want to uh, solve it without uh, uh, basically calling this box or you know using the box as, as, as much as possible. So this this thing is kind of uh, often called uh, the oracle. Um, you guys heard of this oracle? Yeah, okay. in computer science or where where did you hear? This word oracle. In the research of like um, forgetting quantum circuits. Oh, okay, okay. So you heard it in that quantum uh, context, yeah. Okay. I think it's more of a computer science term, so people in computer science can sort of. Uh, but basically, you know, think of it as a black box where you don't know the inner workings. Okay. Okay, and uh, let's see. Uh, so kind of the classical way of working out how this works. So, um, the, the, the kind of the trick to this, in a way, is that um, to work out whether a function is either constant or balanced, right? Um, well, by definition, constant means that, you know, it's flat, right? So, how do you work out if something's flat? Well, you have to, there's no way other than to look, compare these two, both of these uh, outputs, zero and one. So, if you only had zero, there's no way you can tell 
if it's constant or balanced, because constant means it's flat, right? And you need you need to at least get two points, and then you can at least figure out, oh yeah, it looks like it's going to be flat, right? But if you only got one point, you, you can't because you know it could be any any four any one of these four functions. Uh, of course, similarly with uh, this output one, because you know any of these four uh, gives some value, but you need to work out whether it's going to be flat or where it's like floppy like this. So um, we need definitely classically two calls of this oracle to work out whether it's going to be constant or balanced because um, yeah because we need these two output points and then and once we've got the two output points we could do something like we subtract them and if it's if it's zero then then we know it's uh, constant okay so <coughs> So our, our kind of quantum trick that we're going to use is that we are going to put in uh, a superposition of um, x and zero, right? Okay. And basically, when we put that superposition in, the way we're counting things is that, well, you know, we're just still putting in sort of one thing. It's just, okay, it's a quantum superposition of this x and zero, whatever it is. But it's still, still one call, okay. And the idea is that you put that in, and then uh, this, this this oracle evaluates whatever it is, but it evaluates it in this superposition, so that the output is like either f zero, f one, but it's also in a superposition. So this is the basic idea of what we're trying to do. Right? Um, okay, but. Uh, that's a nice basic idea, but actually it doesn't quite work because, for example, um, this is very similar to what we were talking about uh, like last lecture when we were talking about like how single qubit gates are reversible or not reversible. Um, remember we, I was talking about that, um, uh, that uh, logical gate where everything becomes one or everything becomes zero. So it's Exactly the same situation. So, for example, that if the oracle is this f equals one, that basically means it's it's always going to be one, right? And then we're going to end up with a situation that zero goes to one or one goes to one, and this is not a reversible circuit. So, because this is not reversible, we 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 can't implement the oracle uh, quite like this. So this is kind of not quite right. But there's a workaround. So the way that we're going to do it is by um, doing it a little bit more like this. So uh, instead of having uh, just the one input, let's make it something with two inputs. And so here's the input bit, but we've added an extra thing. And what we're going to now do is to make it so that this first one just goes right through. And the second one uh, adds in, and this is this means addition modulo two. Uh, adds in the value of uh, f of x into this y. Okay. And now now it's reversible because, um, and in fact, uh, the the reverse circuit of this is actually itself. So uh, you can just apply two of these, and then it will go back to the initial state and you can just check this because okay so x just becomes x but y um, of course if you do this twice it'll be y uh, plus uh, 2 of f of x and in the binary world 2 two times something is always 0 right because f of x is only 0 or 1 so 2 times 0 is 0 or 2 times 1 is 2, but it's modulo 2, and so modulo 2 modulo 2 is 0, so it's always 0 actually. And then y plus 0 is just y, and so this goes back to the initial state. So um, uh, this, this is a kind of a workaround to make it all reversible, so this is the oracle that, uh, that we're going to work with. And if you're wondering, okay, so uh, if I have, if 
do you have to make this oracle? You know, what, what, what kind of gates am I supposed to put in there? So <coughs> um, the actual gates um, would look like this. So, so for example, if, if you want to make this oracle with fx0, then the thing that we want is that basically this y is always, so this, this output needs to be y plus f of x, right? So uh, if f of x is always 0, then uh, we just don't do anything to y. Okay? So the inside of this oracle is actually just nothing, identity. Um, for this one, f of x1, what we need to do here is, so y plus f of x is y plus 1, and modulo 2 plus 1 is actually like the not, it's the, the opposite <coughs> of y. So, uh, bar y means not y. Right? So uh, in this case, all we have to do is put in an x gate, because that will flip. Another way to view that is that you know, if f of x is 1, then we, we always have to flip the output of y. Okay, um, over here, uh, what we need to do here is if uh, x is 0, then just add 0 to this, in other words, do nothing. Uh, if f is 1, then it's y plus 1, that's basically not y. So it's, it's either y if it's 0 or y, not y if it's 1. So that's exactly what a C not gate does. Lastly, this one I think I forgot to uh, introduce this symbol. So when this, when this thing is like not filled in, what that means is it's like the opposite of the, it's the opposite control. So normally you do this if uh, uh, this qubit is 1, right? So in this case, you do this if this qubit is zero. That's the, um, the sort of the other C naught, if you like. Um, so this one, uh, you, you're going to flip it if it's zero, and not flip it if it's one. So that, that's so good. Okay, but anyway, most people don't even go into this point. But anyway, so such circuits uh, exist for the inside of these this box. Okay, and then uh, then we can kind of do the thing that we were trying to do in the first place. So uh, what we're going to do is we're going to try and evaluate both of these in, like uh, f of uh, f of zero and f of one. We want to do this kind of at the same time, right? So we're going to put in a superposition state. So if we put in zero and Hadamard, so you know just like what we were talking about before, Hadamard on zero makes this superposition. So uh, that's a superposition, and then um, what's going to happen is that uh, this this, uh, this bottom one is going to be uh, zero.
then we're going to apply the oracle. So the apply the oracle to that. And so in each of these terms, uh, the first term stays the same. Second one will be whatever you had at the beginning. So in this case, it would be zero plus or modulo two plus f of x. So that means the uh, the argument here is oh, sorry was uh, zero. So this is f of zero. And okay. And then over here, this one. The first qubit just goes through, nothing happens to it. The second qubit starts with zero, so y is zero here, as modulo two f times by whatever was in the first qubit. And then we can just simplify this because um, zero plus anything is just the same. So this is f of 0, and then this one is f of 1, because again, adding 0 to anything is the same. Okay. So, um, okay, so that's, that's good. Uh, we seem to have something where we've got you know, superposition of both of these um, cases, and so we have maybe a way of figuring out if it's constant or balanced. Um, so, you know, how about we just go and measure this state right now? So we just go and measure this thing, zero, one basis. Um, now, unfortunately, that strategy does not work because if you measure this, say, the first qubit, zero, one basis, then you're going to get that 50% of the time, and you're going to get that 50% of the time. Right? So you're going to get this F0 outcome, F0 outcome half the time, and then the F1 outcome the other half of the time. So uh, that basically means you're going to have to do this a few times to make sure that you get the same, you know, both of those results. So as soon as you get both of those results, then you can make a conclusion that, um, uh, you know, it's constant or balanced, but then, you know, if it's 50-50, then probably you're going to have to do it at least twice, right? Um, so, you know, if you're unlucky and you keep on getting, like, the first one, then you have to, keep, you have to do it even more times, and it's actually worse than the, the classical strategy. So, so, just measuring it is not good. But, um, how about we, let's just put the Hadamard in on the second qubit instead of the first one, just, just for fun. So you see how, uh, any, see if anything changes, okay? Okay, so in this case, what happens is that, um, uh, okay, this is the state I start with, and I'm also starting in the state one, because, well, you'll see. Um, so this is the state I start with, because one applied on Hadamard becomes zero minus one. Okay, and then, then we do the same oracle uh, calculation as before, and uh, now because actually the superposition is on this one, we actually still get a superposition of the second qubit. Okay, and in this case, what's going to happen is that we are, uh, depending on whatever this one is, we're going to add in f of x to zero and one. Okay, and if um, if, uh, if if this first um, uh, sorry, I think I might have made a typo here. So yeah, I think I made a typo here. So I think what I'm trying to say here is that. Oh, no, 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 it's correct, sorry. So, yeah, right, right. So, here, in, th in this case, our x is fixed, 
Okay, so x is either zero or one, right? Okay, and then uh, so whatever that happens to be, so of course um, f of x can only be either zero or one. So there's only actually two cases. So if f of x happens to be zero, uh, then what's going to happen is that this going this is going to be the state zero minus one. Or if f of x is one, then this is actually going to be one plus, uh, sorry, zero plus one, which is one, or one plus one, which is uh, zero. So actually, we get either zero minus one or one minus zero. Okay, and uh, and global phase doesn't matter in this situation. Um, but for the next step, we're going to actually have another Hadamard on the top of here. So, uh, so we're going to write this phase here. And so basically what happens here is that um, depending on if f of x is 0 or 1, you're going to have this extra phase that's going to come out. And, and it's kind of a, you know, this, this is actually something that will be used also for other algorithms like Grover's algorithm. You're going to have something, cons construction like this, so in the end, this is quite um, sort of a, a useful way of um, kind of constructing sort of circuits. So basically, you know, what this does in summary is that, okay, so you have axon x, and then if we prepare this thing in the initial state of minus, then this uh, state will pick up an extra minus one for those cases of f of x that uh, is equal to 1. So that's, that's basically what, what this does. Okay, so if we've got that, then um, if we put an extra Hadamard in here, and then another Hadamard just to measure in the right basis here, then we've actually got our final circuit. Okay, so let's have a look at how this works. So, so basically the major change that we did here was to in include this superposition here, okay, and um, so that's the relation we had on the previous slide. So uh, if we uh, if we now um, this zero plus one is the first qubit here, right? So if we now have this superposition of zero plus one, then basically what's going to happen is that um, you're going to have this minus one phase come out uh, for all these different terms here. So this one is going to evaluate the phase for f zero, and you know if that's if that happens to be zero, then there will be no phase plus one. If that happens to be one, then there will be a minus phase. And something and similarly for here. And <coughs> then, so uh, what we have at the end there is basically the, the, this state, so just, just before we do this measurement, so at the end of the oracle here, we're going to have basically this state. And then if we compare to the four different functions that we could possibly have, uh, we get something like this. So um, if we have the, this function where fx is 0, then in this case, uh, this is 0 here, this is 0 here, so basically both of these phases are plus. Right? So the output of the oracle will be 0 plus 1. Um, but this one, where it's sloping upwards, this phase will be plus 1 and this will be minus 1. Okay? So the output is going to be that state. So this top one, which is a constant, um, then both of these phases will be minus, so it'll be this one. And for the one that's sloping down, we'll have this phase minus this one plus. And <coughs> so uh, now, now you, we're going to do a measurement, and this is where the global phase doesn't matter. So actually this one and this one are actually really you know, basically the same thing because they're both the plus state. But okay, this has a global phase of minus. But you know, it doesn't matter anymore now because we're going to do a measurement. Okay, so um, 
this Hadamard and measurement uh, is exactly actually the example that we that we did on the board here. So um, when when you have the Hadamard and measurement, basically what's what's going to happen is that you're going to be measuring in this uh, plus minus basis, basically. So essentially, what's going to happen after you do this Hadamard measurement thing is that here we've got a plus state, and then over here we've got a uh, over here we've got a minus state. And so uh, you can distinguish between, and that's exactly the cases where this is balanced uh, or constant. So that where you get the plus state, it's constant. Where it's the minus state, it's balanced. And um, so uh, so you can distinguish between the constant and balanced cases. And the key thing is that we only use this oracle once. So we put in that state, or well, put in these states, uh, you only use that oracle once, and you can still work out that the, um, uh, which type of oracle it is. Astounded? <laughs> kind of. <laughs> um, yeah, well, uh, you know, so I, I think this sort of teaches you a couple things that, well, certainly, you know, uh, it's not so easy to make a quantum algorithm, so, you know, the, the naive thing is that you, you can just sort of, you got the superposition here, but actually that doesn't quite really get you the answer. Uh, you need to be a little bit more tricky beyond that, even though that, you know, having the superposition is people, this is what people say gives quantum computers the power, right? Well, so obviously by definition, yes, um, that's true. But it's not quite as simple as just, okay, you got a superposition and then now I can do, you know, you know, billions of different things in parallel. Um, you need a kind of a tricky way of getting the information that you want. Um, and in this case, the information is whether it's balanced or constant. and. Um, and clearly that's sort of a, you know, well, it's a made up kind of problem specifically to show something you want to show, right? Um, but, uh, but it's true that, you know, classically there's no way around it but to measure, um, you know, measure this thing twice. Uh, so um, it's, well, provably faster than than a classical computer because uh, there's really no way of, of working out what the answer to this problem is um, beyond evaluating this thing twice, right? this, this oracle twice. Um, some other problems are actually not provably faster. So, um, so for example, Shaw's algorithm, which have you heard of Shaw's algorithm? It's the algorithm one of the most famous quantum algorithms where um, you uh, uh, factorize numbers. Right. So if you've got some number and you want to factorize it, okay, so 15 is 5 times 3, working out what the factors of 15 are, um, uh, quantum computers can do, the, do that faster. But uh, in that case, it's it's not uh, it's not really provably faster because it's uh, you know somebody might come up with some algorithm of factoring numbers faster. It's just that we don't know. Like people, you know, there's computer scientists come up with algorithms all day to figure out how to do things, and you know they argue over how efficient their algorithms are, but, um, uh, you know, so often, you know, people find better and better algorithms. Um, in that case, I think there's no, not really a proof to show that the, the quantum computers are definitely faster. But for this problem, it's, it's definitely faster because it's kind of obvious from here that, that, that there's just no, you know, in this situation, 
there's just no way other than to evaluate this twice, right? Like there's just no information that you can get just from one point. Um, so this is an example of a provably faster algorithm, quantum algorithm, um, than, than the classical case, um, which is not always the case. Which is sort of my point. Um, okay, and just to finish up. So you might think, okay, fine, the factor of two, you know, big deal. It's, okay, twice as fast, but twice as fast is not that impressive. Um, so what these guys did, uh, Deutsch, Joe, so they came back a few years later and said, okay, fine, we've, we've made a, another version of the algorithm, same idea, that is now this time two to the power of m faster. Um, so that's, that's a little bit more impressive because, of course, that's a much bigger quantum speed up. And in this case, basically, the idea is it's very simple. So you have either uh, these constant cases. Oh, yeah, sorry. And basically, the, the extension is that your, your oracle function now has, like, more input bits. So it's not just binary input. Um, it's... Uh, got more, more variables as the input. And so you have either constant or balanced algorithms. So balanced ones have equal numbers of ones and zeros. And uh, the circuit looks quite similar. Uh, it's really basically the same idea, actually. So um, you, you can work out whether um, the state is, oh, sorry, the, the oracle of these two, two types by performing some measurement on these qubits up here. Um, if it's, uh, yeah, if it's, I think, x equals zero, then it's balanced, uh, oh, constant, rather, and then otherwise it's balanced. But, um, let's go into it more than that. Okay. It's kind of hard to to understand all these definitions. Mm. So I don't quite um, understand how the the addition modulo. Oh, um, yeah, modulo two addition is, is is simply just um, so uh, well x y x plus y modulo two it just means okay so zero 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 one one zero one one um, so basically yeah, yeah I mean uh, you know what. Well, to me, so, um, so 1 plus 0 is 0. 1 plus 1 binary in language is, is, is 1, 0, right? But then if you look at the, le the lowest bit, it's 0 because, um, yeah, so, so normally it would be 1, 1, 0, but then if we, if we look at the lowest significant bit, then it's actually zero. So, so that's, that's pretty much, um, yeah, but the, the modular, modular addition, so, yeah, well, it's just, you know, it's just regular addition, but then you take the mod two of the output. Okay, all right, then we'll uh, start with, I think, um, teleportation next. So. Is it the last slide? Yeah, this was the last slide, yeah. Yeah, uh, I mean the teleportation is the last slide. Uh, no, no, uh, we've also got Grover. Uh, 